registering for this um, webinar and uh, thank you to CLEAR for, for supporting uh, our team. Um, Hannah and I are really excited to talk with you today um, about Collections as Data Part to Whole. Um, specifically, this is the uh, a webinar focused on the Cohort 2 um, component of the overall project, the funding opportunity and the cohort development opportunity. Um, so before I get started, I just want to make sure, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, sound good. Okay. Thanks, Anna. And yep, okay, that's a pretty enthusiastic yes <laughs> from <laughs> everyone in the room. <laughs> okay, so I, I'm going to get started, uh, and then I'll be handing off to, to Hannah um, uh, to talk in, in greater detail about the CFP. Um, so I'm launching the presentation. Okay. Getting the good to go from Hannah. Okay. So, yes, thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is the uh, webinar uh, focused on the Cohort 2 uh, funding and cohort development opportunity of Collections as Data Part to Whole. Uh, here is a screenshot of the call for proposals. It is currently uh, on our website now. Um, the uh, CFP officially opened on uh, August 1st, which I hope was not a weekend. Uh, but it opened on August 1st. Uh, it closes on October 31st, um, so there's some time to, to develop proposals. Um, project overall is, uh, you know, we are very uh, grateful to the Mellon Foundation for supporting this project. Um, we're, we're happy that this work is, is able to take place uh, because of their support. Um, the project team itself uh, is uh, myself. I'm at, I'm at UNLV or the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Uh, Hannah Skates Cutler on the call with us today at Ohio Iowa State University. I almost said Ohio. I'm in Ohio right now. Sorry. I'm not in a Hollywood green screen studio. I'm in, in, in Ohio. But uh, Hannah recently moved to uh, Iowa State. Congratulations, Hannah. Um, and then Lori Allen and Stuart Varner, uh, who were not able to be with us today. Uh, we have an excellent advisory board for this project, uh, Dan Cohen, Greg Yao, uh, Greg recently moved to the Center for Research Libraries from MIT, Karen Eslin, Burgess Jules, who at some point in this project moved to shift, uh, Trevor Munoz, and Barbara Rockenbach. So just a general structure of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, we're hoping to actually not talk that much. Uh, we're hoping to hear more from you. Um, but just generally, uh, I'm going to go over sort of a, a part to whole overview, so overview of this project. Um, I'll hand off to Hannah, and Hannah's going to get into some detail about the components of the CFP and what we're looking for, and, and then we'll just open it up to Q&A. Any questions that you have, we'll try and answer them. No promises that we can answer all of them, um, but we will definitely try. So part to whole overview. Um, <clears throat> you know, this particular project on, you know, collections as data, this, you know, it comes out of this uh, IMLS-supported project called Always Already Computational Collections as Data. Uh, it ran roughly 2016 to 2018. Uh, it was an effort of myself, uh, Lori Allen, Stuart Varner, Hannah Frost, Sarah Potvin, and Elizabeth Russi Roke. And you know, that project had sort of this one, one of the core claims in that project, at least as it started, and the scope of it kind of changed over time as we learned more from the community. Um, but one of the original claims was essentially that um, uh, cultural heritage organizations, you know, we've been digitizing stuff for a long time now and we've increasingly we're dealing with more digital content um, and that, uh, you know, perhaps, you know, some of the ways that we're approaching thinking about description and access for these collections um, might actually kind of create barriers for researchers or students or, or folks working in other sectors who want to work with our collections as data. We want to use computational methods. Um, who want to think of the collections as uh, something that could be potentially machine actionable. And so we embarked on a two year, two and a half year project. Um, we did a ton of community engagement, you know, traveled to over a dozen different conferences, held two national forums, um, and we had anticipated producing three deliverables in that project and it ended up being closer to seven or eight. Um, so <laughs> we were very busy. Uh, the kinds of things that we, we produced were things like the Santa Barbara Statement on Collections as Data, which was in turn, uh, we should probably document this. Um, maybe this would be like a post webinar fix. Um, but our, our thinking around why a Santa Barbara statement on collections is data, part of that, it was inspired by the Denton Declaration on Open Access, 
Um, so we were thinking that it might be useful to have a document that sort of brings together um, sort of guiding principles for doing collections as data work that are, that are ethically grounded, that are historically contextualized, and are the product of a lot of community feedback. Uh, so we put together the Santa Barbara Statement on Collections as Data after Form 1, and then over a period of two years, we workshopped it and versioned it. Um, and now it exists as a, as a version 2 document that's meant to sort of um, um, articulate a shared set of values uh, uh, that we believe are important um, in undertaking collections as data work. Uh, in addition to that, we did things like create document use cases, create personas, um, collect position statements, articulate methods papers, uh, collect different ways to get started in doing collections as data work, and there's even a white paper out there in the world. So we did a lot of stuff. At the end of that project, uh, you know, we felt that there, there was some work to do still, right? So this is why we have collections as data part the whole. Um, that first project that I've been talking about now for the you know, past few minutes um, was, largely question, was largely focused on the question of implementation. Um, so you know, what does it take to descri describe, prepare, and provide access to machine actionable collections as an implementation question. Um, but then if we consider where the other foot drops, um, say more of us start doing this kind of work, um, once that other foot drops, like how well are we prepared to sort of sustainably support the use of machine actionable collections? And that's where collections as data part to whole aims to sort of like pick up the slack. So still address the implementation thing, but really we have a focus in this, the Mellon phase of the project on, um, you know, models that support the use of machine actionable collections. So collections as data part to whole, it's a three year project, uh, 2019 to 2021. Um, and I'm having trouble reading my own, oh, there I can minimize myself. Okay, so collections as data part to whole, kind of the core goal here is we're aiming to foster the development of broadly viable models that support implementation and use of collections as data. Okay. Oops, sorry. Uh, so over the course of the project, we're going to regrant six hundred thousand dollars to twelve projects across two cohorts. Each cohort will be responsible for creating a use model, an implementation model, and the collections as data. So Hannah will get into more detail of, about what we mean by each of these things, but just quickly I'll, I'll, I'll try and gloss them. Um, and then Hannah I will, will reemphasize and speak more eloquently to it than, than I will. Um, we wanna do it twice. Um, so uh, what we're hoping for is a use model. So a use model is essentially like the collections of um, uh, descriptions of, of roles and services and cross departmental collaborations that uh, you are, are, are making an argument for that this is a useful model um, for supporting collections as data. Uh, and then with the implementation model, it's, it's a similar set of things. You know, what are the roles? What are the services? Uh, what are the, you know, different kinds of documentation and, and code that you're using in order to prepare, uh, you know, describe, prepare, and provide access to collections as data? And then finally, uh, uh, some kind of collection as data must be produced. Um, and uh, we are encouraging collections as data that speak to um, underrepresented histories. Uh, just a, a couple of more things uh, that I want to call out, and again, this is in the in the language of the CFP. Um, but what we're really hoping for, hoping to see in proposals are um, collaborations across an organization that support computational use of collections as data. Um, uh, of course, I could imagine a proposal that, that comes out of a digital scholarship group where it's, you know, largely digital scholarship staff. Um, but uh, what we're hoping to see um, are sort of like reaching across the organization, reaching across different departments in creative ways. Um, we encourage you to think about, you know, using this as an opportunity to kind of form the kinds of collaborations you've been wanting to have that might be a little bit elusive across different silos in your organization. Um, and finally, I would just say that, you know, we believe that there's a place in this work for people throughout an org organization. Um, and it's not limited to, you know, liaisonship, teaching and learning, repository development, digital collections, digital scholarship, archives, scholarly communication, that, that basically, you know, we think that there are ways to be innovative and creative and finding a place for multiple people. Um, to contribute to this work. And so we'd look forward to seeing proposals that kind of think through those dimensions. 
Um, cohort teams themselves consist of a senior administrator, um, a project lead, and a disciplinary scholar. Uh, Hannah will speak more to why that is, that is the case, why we have this particular focus on a team leadership composition. Um, I will mention briefly that it's, it is probably not lost on most of you that we have already regranted to the first cohort. Um, it's a nice range of institutions. Uh, we, have, we have a museum, uh, we have the Weeksville Historical Society, and then we have sort of an, an admixture of different research universities. And I would just talk sort of briefly about UNC's project, just to kind of give you a sense of one of the projects. If, if you're not familiar with cohort one, um, this one comes out of UNC, it's called On the Books, Jim Crow and Algorithms of Resistance. Uh, goal of this project is to make North Carolina legal history accessible as a text corpus. And so there's going to be this production of a, a text corpus, it's going to be a project website, there's going to be a GitHub repo that makes all of the code available, and there'll be white papers and, and so forth. And I would just kind of like call attention quickly to the team composition here, right? Um, so this, this is really interesting, right? So we have our senior um, sort of administrator, AUL for Special Collections, and then we have staff, you know, and Nathan Kelber, who has since moved on, um, but Nathan Kelber, Matt Jansen, and Amanda Henley, who are organizationally in, in, in different parts of the library structure. Um, and then we have a couple of other folks. So, and then we have William Sturkey, the faculty member of history. So we, I just wanted to call out this project because it's an interesting sort of creative um, approach to, to bridging across different parts of the organization um, to make the legal history of North Carolina available um, and to support its use. Um, with that said, uh, I, I do want to also say that, uh, you know, while we love, we love our cohort one projects, um, we encourage you to not read between the lines too much uh, in terms of what we have regranted to previously. Um, we uh, are not trying to send the signal that, you know, we only want to fund projects like this. Um, quite to the contrary, we want um, increased diversification of approaches and models and types of content that you might propose to work with. Um, so I just wanted to call that out really quickly. Um, you know, what do you, what do you get if you take part in this project? Um, so, you know, so one, you can, uh, you know, apply for up to $50,000. Um, and then as a cohort development activity, you'll also take part in a team lead institute where sort of the team leads from all the projects will get together within the, four, the first four months of the project. You'll all come together. Um, we will recruit two experts, uh, a disciplinary faculty member and a senior library administrator or cultural heritage administrator to come in and work with us to run sort of a co cohort development activity for you all. So you can sort of exchange um, sort of perspectives and approaches really early on in your project. So you have the opportunity to adjust your project plans um, toward the beginning of the project. And then finally, there will be a public summative forum um, where uh, you will share the, uh, your work um, and your outputs with the broader community. Uh, so with that, I am going to stop sharing and I'm gonna hand it off to Hannah to walk us through the CFP in greater detail. Okay, so have I successfully shared my screen? <laughs> okay, great. And can you hear me? Obviously, you can hear me. Okay. Um, so yeah, let's dive right into um, the CFP. So the CFP is live. Um, I believe uh, Krista has linked that in the chat. Um, and we'll take a look at that here. We've tried to outline the most pertinent information up front, and that is the deadline and how much you will be getting. <laughs> um, so the deadline for submission is October 31st. It is live at any point you can submit a proposal um, from now until then. Uh, the projects will be decided on and um, announced in January 2020. 
with the intended end date of all the projects by April 2021. Thomas has given you a great background. If you have additional questions about that, um, we can certainly answer those. Um, but I wanted to get into what exactly we were looking for um, from the CFP. So you would be getting uh, $50,000 to support the development of a use model, um, an implementation model, as well as a collection of data as part of this project. Now, this is where we've further uh, defined what we mean by the use and implementation model specifically. Um, and the use model is, as Thomas alluded to earlier, um, a collection of uh, positions or, or duties or services that is supported throughout the organization through um, interesting and novel collaborations, as it may be, um, to support the creation and long-term maintenance um, of collections as data or collections as data efforts within your institution. The idea of these projects is that we would uh, be funding those that could be sustained um, long, long term, or at least beyond the project grant cycle. Um, definitely beyond that. That's something that we do look for. Um, we also look at um, the implementation models or, or, or proposed implementation models um, as part of the CFP that describe workflows and infrastructure and code. It's much more about the the, the back end things of how these this collections this data work gets done. Um, and again, how that they get done, but also sustained um, beyond the grant cycle or April 2021. In addition to the collections as data, which we have found in our uh, past work and iterations of the cohort, that's not really the hard part. <laughs> um, but we can definitely answer questions about that as well. Uh, we also outline in that section, of course, what a competitive proposal looks like. Um, it it uh, looks towards these creative ways of, of making connections across institutions, across um, organizations, um, and sustainable collaborations, as well as um, the, the mixture of folks that um, have applied previously or are in this cohort as we pull it together as well. We are also looking for um, the development of collections as data that, that represent uh, typically underrepresented um, voices within our, our, our digital collections or archives um, historically. And ethical care of the creation and collection and distribution of these data. So the things that are supported as part of this, this grant, including buyout staff time or faculty time, um, room rentals, fees or training, uh, consulting outside of the institution should um, uh, expertise lie without. Um, so that those are some, there are some options and flexibilities on how the $50,000, up to $50,000 uh, can be spent. We did in this round, um, do a little bit more explicit documentation of the evaluation uh, criteria, um, including um, some additional detail about what we look for in um, the use and implementation models, as well as the proposed collections as data. You will find that some of this uh, information is uh, repeated, <laughs> and we thought that that was important. Um, because these are areas that we look for across these different components. So if they are repeated, we are looking for them to be, um, well, not repeated word for word, um, at least the values and expectations are repeated in these different sections. Um, so if there, are, if there are questions about the evaluation criteria, that's something that we can definitely uh, talk more about. Um, but we are looking for how these projects can be supported throughout the project. Um, we are not fans of funding contingent labor. <laughs> um, that's something that's not made explicit, but definitely um, one of the things that uh, we are concerned with is supporting these, again, these projects beyond the grant cycle and providing a way to, to move forward institutional support and infrastructure for this type of work. We are looking for applications of 
folks who are um, within the United States or an associated entity. Um, that is something that uh, Mellon requires as part of this grant. So that's something that we have to adhere to pretty closely. Um, and then of course we have details of what the submission um, looks like. This can be a PDF or a, a docx or what have you. The format is less um, a concern, but these elements um, should be addressed in your proposal. And we've given some examples of how uh, long we expect um, particular sections to be. Um, they can be under, that's, that's fine. This is not like you must fill 1500 words. <laughs> Uh, but if you can get the point across in less than that, that's totally uh, legit. And there's some detail about what uh, these individual sections are, but if you, as you, as you work through your proposals, have questions about any of these sections um, or uh, would like some clarification, we can, we can uh, just talk through that uh, with you one-on-one -on -one, um, or an additional um, time, which is scheduled for August 19th. I think we have another webinar um, that we're happy to, to address um, additional uh, questions that you have as you're working through this. Uh, you can contact Thomas Padilla directly, or we also have a link uh, in, in our CFP uh, using a form that will reach all of the members, um, uh, Stuart, Lori, Tom, Thomas, and I um, through, through that mechanism as well. And I do want to call out that we do have a code of conduct. If you would please review that um, as well. We um, take these uh, concerns very seriously. And these are things that we uphold even within our um, evaluation, of course, of, of the, the proposal. So um, that is uh, the CFP, broadly speaking. Uh, Thomas did also mention uh, the, the makeup of the teams that should have at least three roles represented. Um, the senior administrator, uh, the, the uh, disciplinary scholar, as well as the project lead. Now the senior administrator is there um, specifically to uh, create real uh, buy-in <laughs> from an administrative level. Some of the things that we were seeing in the earlier iterations of this project um, in the IMLS uh, funded portion um, of collections as data was that there was a lot of interest um, and a lot of even expertise available to draw on. But one of the things that we were seeing was the support um, at, a, at a higher level or across institutional was um, lacking or at the very least understated. Um, and so we called a senior administrator out specifically as part of this grant so that they are made aware and have I mean, honestly, have to be involved in, in the grant writing process um, so that they're part of, of the team. And that can be defined as, um, uh, as allowable by your institution. It could, it, it's gonna be different. We left that kind of open so that um, different types of roles could be represented in that, in that area. But someone who basically makes decisions <laughs> or has, um, uh, input on where funding and resources and staff time go. Uh, the disciplinary scholar is there to speak to the um, significance of the collection that is, is being created um, so that they can articulate the use and applicability in their, in their discipline, um, in their local context, um, in teaching and learning, um, in community engagement, but also broadly. Um, so that's why that's why they are there um, also to be um, helpful in developing a more uh, well rounded collection as data that might otherwise not be um, possible. And then the project lead. And this is really the person who who gets all the stuff done. <laughs> um, in in some cases, there is one person who's uh, the, for example, the uh, senior administrative person tasks with doing all of the work. Um, and so we wanted to uh, make that labor explicit um, and also uh, put, put that work at the same level as any disciplinary scholar or someone who was controlling the purse strings. So um, it was uh, 
the so this makeup um, uh, is of folks who are all in the same level in terms of this these projects are concerned um, and they can look differently based um, on the institution that you are coming from um, and we can talk about what that looks like on an individual level as well um, if it's if it's not uh, clear um, so that's the makeup of the teams uh, is there anything I'm missing Thomas from the the CFP. Okay, great. Um, let me jump back over to our presentation then. Can you still see it or is it stop sharing? Okay, I thought it stopped sharing. Let's do this again. Are we back on? Are we live? Cool. All right. So the timeline. Uh, I mentioned this already, but the CFP is open now. Yay. Um, that's why you guys are here. Um, it is open until October. Uh, we will initiate the um, successful projects um, in January 2020. The public forum for um, the, these, these projects is January 2021 which will be in um, Las Vegas, right? Well, let's go, let's go to Las Vegas in January. Yeah, that sounds great. I'm from Iowa, so uh, it's not happening here. <laughs> um, and then we will release the models and, uh, and collections in April, 2021. And these, the, the models and the collections are those that are created by you all um, in, consult and in collaboration with each other, of course. All right, so that's the shakedown of the CFP and the project as we've developed over the last few years. And we would like to open it up for your questions or concerns or, or what have you. Um, it can be as broad as you, what kinds of projects do you think you might wanna have? <laughs> because we certainly have thoughts of that, but, um, or as detailed as, am I a project lead? <laughs> Span the gamut. All right. Oh, I can stop sharing my screen too. Oh yes, and we should say the recording of today's session um, will be made available from the Collections as Data website um, for reviewing. Hey Thomas, how about I read the questions and then you can respond to them? Does that sound good? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, apologies if I miss any of them. Let's see. Does a cross institutional team uh, consisting of two universities qualify? Yes. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> no, uh, yes, it does. Um, I think. Rebecca, if that's, uh, get it. okay, that's another question. Um, but yeah, cross-institutional teams um, of two universities do qualify. Um, this question has come up a couple of different times in interactions with uh, potential applicants where they might say like, um, oh, you know, we have this particular collection, but the disciplinary scholar who's like the primary expert um, that we would want to work with is actually at a different university. Um, then that's, that, uh, that's totally cool. If there's going to be some sort of like cross-institutional um, collaboration there. Um, or Hannah, how about I take how about I take a couple and then and then I'll like hand off to you. Okay. Uh, so can you elaborate on what a use model would look here on and this is from Alexandra on how it's different from the implementation model. Okay. So um, the description of them is really similar. Uh, one. So we acknowledge that that's <laughs> we're trying to be as clear as possible, but you know we we're we're still trying to learn. Um, but um, 
essentially, you know, as we think about collections as data, we're thinking about how do you prepare and make accessible the collections? Um, how do you create machine actionable subsets or derivatives out of the existing collections um, so that people can use them? So think of that as an implementation question. Um, and as an implementation question, uh, if you're thinking about a model that you want to share with the rest of the community, um, part of that model is going to be a description of, well, like, who are the people who did that, who, who made the collections available? What did they do? <laughs> um, how did they work together? Uh, what kind of code did they develop? What, what does their infrastructure look like? Um, and so we think of that collection of things as the implementation model. With the use model, we're thinking about basically the same set of considerations, but how does a library or an archive or a museum then support the use of the data, um, say by a digital humanist or uh, a computational social scientist or a journalist who's interested in doing data-driven journalism? What are the kinds of collaborations that might happen between different parts of the library to sustainably support the use of collections as data in an organization. So similar set of considerations in terms of their proposed model. Um, who are the people that are involved? What percentage of their time is being allocated? Um, what are the actual duties that are sort of coming into play? Um, and then, you know, sort of like, how are they gonna support that kind of activity over time? Uh, and okay. I'll just add. Oh yeah. Yep. Yeah, so the, the models themselves are intended to be um, uh, used beyond uh, the institution. So the idea is that other like institutions can look at these models and adapt them for their own uh, local use, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's, it. that's a great point. Um, so I'm going to hand off, hand, I'll hand off to you for maybe the, the next couple. So I think it's the Rebecca's question about sustainability. Uh, so how do you define project sustainability? Do you mean matching funds or infrastructural support? Um, so that's, that's a little bit of both, actually. Um, uh, when, what we're looking for in terms of what might be sustainable is, one, um, are the necessary people um, involved, necessary skill sets there to help or, or support the, these types of, of projects long term? Um, and so that, I mean, and that is um, also, that, that's about infrastructure, right? Um, and it also includes, are those, you know, relationships there that are necessary to, to support this kind of work as well? It may not necessarily be within a particular institution, as Thomas alluded to, um, but can those kinds of, can that kind of network be maintained over time? Um, and this, in a lot of cases, looks like, is, is this something that the institution can afford to do, right? Um, is this something um, that can be done within a particular budget um, that they've outlined over multiple years, sustained over multiple years um, for, for different projects, if they would like to, to, to do more of this, right? Um, so though we are looking at, a, you know, a single collection as data, um, we are looking at can this be this, this kind of work be maintained um, beyond this 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 funding cycle and this particular project. Um, the idea being that we want to continue to develop collections as data because this is how people access them um, and being able to support or sustain that kind of work long term is something that we're that we're looking for. Um, I hope that answers your question, Rebecca. Yeah, I, I would just add like a, a little bit to that is that and kind of like would turn it back that, you know, we're also relying upon upon you to make a case for for what sustainable means like in, in your particular context. Um, to me, it kind of like it's kind of runs akin in my mind to how uh, we have discussions about scalability a lot in, in, in libraries. Um, but sometimes perhaps there's not a super critical engagement with what that means. Um, and I think that there's like a range of what um, of arguments that could be made about like what is sustainable and what is not sustainable. Um, in particular, if I think about, you know, the idea of scale, um, there was a project at, uh, I believe it was at Duke, um, where they had these experimental humanities labs. 
and uh, I think they only supported a certain number per year, and then they they were meant to end. Like <laughs> they were meant to be experimental. They had a very you know clear beginning, a very clear you know shared understanding that they were going to end, and then they ended. Um, and so th the scaling there was really I think only like three or four projects at a time for a couple years and then they ended and then there was like a new set of things. So it's like a different articulation of like what sustainability and what scale means. And I think, you know, as you're developing these models, I think there's something there to be said about an argument for a certain kind of sustainability um, that's particular to the kind of institution that you're at. Um, and, you know, as we're looking at proposals from different institutions, um, we are open to a range of definitions for what that means, right? Like sustainability may look different for a historical society, um, you know, versus a, a very large public R1. It looks like Anna the next is what kinds of spending are prohibited. Okay. Uh, yeah, so what kinds of spending is prohibited, um, technology, infrastructure. Um, so really what we're um, targeting here is, is supporting, um, supporting people's time um, to contribute to this kind of work. I don't, we didn't f fund anyone with tech requirements. I think that was that's something that we're not uh, funding is uh, buying technology. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by infrastructure exactly, um, but in terms of um, supporting people's training, certainly, um, supporting people's time, yes, supporting their travel, yes, um, and space, yes. <laughs> um, very small organizations. Fulfilling all the participant parts of the grant application, how broadly are you defining cross-departmental? So um, this, again, is something that we are looking uh, to you to define. Um, this can be um, interfacing with the one IT person that you know. Um, <laughs> and that can be as inter- or cross-departmental as your institution may get. Um, what we're really just looking for is um, that there is sufficient uh, work across um, particular silos that um, are required to do this type of work so that people aren't, you know, just working within um, the collection curator circle. I, I'm not entirely sure um, what your organization looks like, but um, the idea is really just to get at are the necessary collaborations there to support this work broadly um, at, at your institution? And in a lot of cases, it looks like I'm going to reach out to so and so from, um, uh, you know, research services as well as um, library archives IT and someone who's, you know, in some cases outside of my institution um, that has disciplinary expertise. So. Um, it's it's pretty broad. Um, it's really just talking about you know collaboration across people who might not necessarily collaborate otherwise. So I'll take I'll take the next one. This is from Matthew Battles. Um, can you talk a bit about the nature of the collections in question? Uh, is there a sweet spot when it comes to the tangibility, materiality, cohesiveness, hybridity of collections? Um, I would say that uh, it, at the beginning of the CFP, we do try and call out, um, we're encouraging uh, additional content types in, in collections for this round. Um, we, we love text and we love metadata and we will continue to love text and metadata. Um, it, our cohort one is a lot of text and metadata. Um, and uh, we'll be super excited to see more of those proposals in this round. But we would also be excited to see some proposals related to different kinds of different kinds of content, either digitized or born digital. Um, and in terms of types, you know, moving image, um, audio, um, 3D, which uh, you know, you know, yeah, Hannah, Hannah's doing a thumbs up. <laughs> um, 
so I, I would say uh, like we're gonna love all of them equally, uh, <laughs> but we do want to encourage uh, perhaps you know additional kinds of content to be submitted um, in this round. Uh, the the really important part um, with respect to the collection is that uh, is that it does speak to you know the history of you know, under underrepresented groups. Um, and, and we detail that uh, within the CFP. Okay, so next question. Besides the users uh, Thomas listed, um, could another user be an institute within my university, but not within the library? Uh, my first thought I haven't seen, first slide is I haven't seen this kind of question before. So, so I'm like a little slow. <laughs> uh, my first thought is sure. I don't know, Hannah, Hannah, what do you think? Yeah, I think if you can define them as an active user, um, I think that that's, that's fine. Um, the thing I would really highlight though then is how your particular project or model models um, are more broadly applicable beyond um, your institution. So it could be that, because um, I, I think it's perfectly um, legitimate to consider a user of the collections as data as someone who's local. I think that's fine um, and, and relevant. I think there's a lot of uh, contexts where that would be the case. Um, and, I, and, and so articulating how that looks more broadly um, I think might be helpful, but I, I think that makes total sense. Yeah, I, I, I would just add to that a little bit that the, um, you know, one of the, one of the aspects that's going to become important is through your disciplinary scholar role. Um, because, you know, a big part of the reason why, why while they are there, why, uh, tongue tied, um, why they are there uh, uh, is to help sort of like vouch for the, the di potential disciplinary impact um, of the sort of work that you're proposing to do with the collection. Um, so that seems to me like it could be, um, that would be a pretty core part of a, of a proposal like that. Um, Thomas, and if, you wanna lead into the next question? It's kind of talking about the scholarly role. I think it might oh, be sure. Okay, so this is, could you clarify a little bit more about the scholar role? Would this be limited to scholars who are experts in the content of the collection or would scholars who are experts in computational methods to be used to process the collections as data be acceptable, for example, data science or computer science? Um, sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that they would be um, acceptable too. Um, you know, especially if there is a case to be made about um, like the extent to which like their uh, methodological expertise, um, you know, putting it at work in this project. Would, al would allow for some disciplinary innovation for them, right? So if they're working in computer science and they have some kind of a computer vision approach that they're developing and they, they want to test it with the collection, then, then to me, it's like they're, they're almost like it's like a twofer, like they're doing both at once. <laughs> um, so I, I would say yes. I don't know, Hannah, what do you think? Yeah, no, I think that would be cool. Okay. Hannah, do you want to take the, the next one? Okay. Library, oh, where collections is already necessary and common. Yeah, okay. That might not have been the question. I'm sorry if I read it as such. Anyway, so can we pull in individuals from another organization or library? Yes. Um, they can be in, uh, what we've seen mainly is as disciplinary scholars, I think is where we've seen it. Um, there's also been some collaboration outside of the institution for technological support to 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 create um, the infrastructure needed for this um, this kind of work. So yes, you can pull individuals from outside um, the organization or the library. And the project that Thomas showed you already, um, you may have noticed that the project team was like was it six people something like that yeah um, and we identify three so there must be three um, members of the of the team um, at a bare minimum and then you can add and remix as, as you see fit um, for the needs of, of the project insofar as those three 
um, roles are fulfilled, if that makes sense. So that, that too can be an, an area where you add or pull in people from outside the organization as your auxiliary members um, to help support the project. Uh, can you define contingent labor? Does that include hiring graduate students to do some of the work? So do you want to take this or do you want, <laughs> or do you want me to take or? Uh, I think we can both take it okay. um, because this is one of the things that that we, you know, um, are, are dealing with um, with some of these projects. Um, and we are adamant in that we support the development of the um, institutional capacity for these for this for this work. Um, and the projects may run into an issue when, say, a graduate student um, graduates, right? And then what do you do with their their knowledge of the project and their uh, contribution, um, as well as their continued work um, once they graduate? Uh, that might not be applicable to to you um, or or your project, but that's something to consider. So the idea is that we're building institutional capacity for the the people who um, propose projects uh and so we've we've been putting our foot down on not hiring you know term appointments and things like that to make sure that that kind of work can be supported at that institution um in the long term but you can certainly feel free to hire graduate students as part of your project <laughs> Yeah, I think that the, you know, one of the, the core things to think about is that, um, you know, part of our intention with this work and the development of these models is, is to help you change local practice. Um, so, uh, so that it is sustainable, like over time, right? Um, so, you know, I think that there is an argument to be made for having graduate students be like a core part of that. Um, and that, that argument can definitely be made and was made in, in the cohort one projects. Um, but we, we also want to be thinking about this as an opportunity to like, you know, for our people that are like here and that are like going to be here, right? What, <laughs> like, what can we do to help them? You know, how could this be an opportunity to think creatively about like what we can do together? The folks that are like going to be here, you know, hopefully for the long term. Uh, what's the last one? Are there requirements for open accessibility or copyright considerations regarding the data? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think these made it into our second version of the CFP. I feel like in the first version of the CFP, we required releasing um, under an open license. Mm -hmm. Um, so this could be an, an oversight on our part in terms of like not carrying it over into the, the second CFP. Um, but I believe the general expectation is that we, we want the, you know, the collections that are produced in the course of the project, as well as the code that is produced in the course of the project um, to be openly available. Um, of course, like if there are, uh, you know, particular qu ethical questions that arise in the course of or your project, um, where it's where it's not appropriate for um, um, particular aspects of your collections work to be made available more widely, um, then then definitely we're open, um, uh, you know, to, to an argument to like not release those things. Mm -hmm. In fact, we would not want you to release them. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, we do harp on the ethical considerations of creating these collections as data, and if as part of that project you consider certain parts yeah. to be um not or shouldn't be openly available then make the argument and that's that's fine yeah and i would also say it's interesting that it's coming up through this route but um i guess it makes sense that the you know within your proposal like how you were proposing to address the you know, sort of like ethical dimensions ethical implications of the proposed work is so so important mm -hmm. um it, and you know if if it's if if it's not addressed, then or if it's if it's not clear, um, 
then, then that's, that's really, really, really going to weaken the proposal. Um, so it's an opportunity, uh, <laughs> you know, especially in thinking about like increased awareness in our communities of some of the ethical missteps that we have had. Um, it's an opportunity to really model, um, you know, how you think we should be doing this kind of work. And we're super interested in seeing you make that case. Yeah, I just got goosebumps thinking about it. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> Images, metadata. Do you have any applications from cohort one that were working with images, metadata, representing historical artifacts, 3D? And do you have any caveats, advice for proposals related to material culture? No, I think is the short answer to that, right? I think so. I, I think we we can't really go into detail about applications from the prior from the prior cohort pool. I think we may have had one or two. Um, in terms of advice for proposals related to material culture, um, I think really it would just be being aware of where the material culture came from, potential um, ownership, copyright issues that might be around those artifacts. Um, and honestly acknowledging those. Um, and if you can address them as part of the project proposal, um, it would be cool. <laughs> they're loaded, right? They're, they're that would be a loaded collection. And I think that's, that's great. And I think that's something that we like to see as part of a cohort um, development. Uh, what sorts of AV propo proposals would you be excited to receive? Um, I think I'm going to kick, I think I'm going to kick it back to our CFP on maybe on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how, spe how specific we could be uh, uh, about that. Um, you know, I, don't, I don't know, Hannah, do you have, do you have specific thoughts or? I can't, well. I think it would be cool to receive some AV proposals, but I, I don't yeah. know that it, how specific we can be about um, what we'd be excited about. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, it's kind of hard to say just because there are four of us looking at these um, in, in, and we all have very different tastes. <laughs> <laughs> so I know that's not very helpful, but um, there, our tastes span a lot of broad interests. So I think it would be, uh, the, the world is your oyster <laughs> in terms of <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and we will be, you know, adhering to the evaluation criteria. Yeah. Um, and uh, we'll likely seek feedback from um, our advisory uh, group as well on the on the proposals. Mm -hmm. And honestly, if you think it's cool, um, that comes through in the proposal writing, and we get excited about people who are excited. Yeah, it's true. So we have three minutes left. Any any remaining questions out there? Yeah, there's that other module, right? A little Q&A box. Oh, okay. Thank you. More in the Q&A box. Okay, so maybe, oh, very helpful. Oh, thanks, Sean. We appreciate that. Um, so maybe we will end a couple of minutes early. And so that will give you some breathing room between this meeting and your next meeting. Um, and uh, I guess we'll just quickly say that we do have a whole nother session supported by CLEAR on August 19th um, that is wholly devoted to Q&A, uh, the whole thing. There's no presentation. It's just like everyone can just come in and like ask all the questions that they want. 
Mm -hmm. um, that's August 19th. It's at the same time. Um, the link is uh, on the project site. Um, and maybe we'll do some tweeting of it as well. Um, you can always reach out to the team uh, and ask us a question throughout the proposal development process. Um, uh, contact us whenever you want. We haven't reached a limit yet in terms of how many questions people are asking us. <laughs> so, you know, maybe, maybe you want to push that limit. Um, and uh, thank you so much for registering today. It was really fun to talk with you all. Yeah, this is great. And I should say you, you should, you, you'll probably be, um, as you're asking questions and requesting um, calls or what have you, you might get a mixture of us. So it might not just be me and Thomas all the time. It could be Lori and Stuart involved um, in various combinations of the project team. Um, and the advisors as well. We've been hooking up people with um, the advisory group. True.